Welcome to Smart. Now, Kirst, have you got your stuff ready for the first arty item? I have indeed. Uh, what is it then? Guess. Guess? Oh, come on, it could be anything. Uh, give me a clue. All right then. Oh, it's got something to do with the elements. Elements? Mm. Oh, um, uh, fire. <laughs> water! Water! <laughs> <laughs> no, it's neither of those. Yeah. Uh, earth? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it must be air then. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes, it's air. Actually, it's wind more than air. I uh, let you down with a clue there, I'm sorry. Anyway, shall we crack on? Great air, by the way, Mark. Crack on? I've got to get cleaned up first. <laughs> My wind idea is based on the fact that on the 5th of May in Japan, there's a special festival. It's called Children's Day, and people make wind socks like these in the shape of carp. And then what they do is hang them outside their houses because they're meant to symbolise success. Yeah, well, I've been very successful getting cleaned up. You've got a leaf stuck in your hair there oh. still. <laughs> right, to make these wind socks, what you need is a rectangle of greaseproof paper, and then just fold that rectangle in half like so and then I'm just going to do the tail by just nicking in like that with some scissors making the tail shape and then you're ready to decorate your fish make sure you keep the edge at the top up there and then the brushes we're going to use are these Japanese brushes so the trick with this mark is to keep them upright and just do very light strokes we're gonna use ink okay I'm actually making a dragon oh nice here we go Start doing my scales now. Oh, I like that. The trick, of course, as well, is to remember that you've got to paint both sides of these. But the beauty of the greaseproof paper is that you can just trace it so you can see through it. Now I'm going to start colouring mine in using some coloured inks. Let's do. They're quite nice to paint with these brushes, aren't they? Mm. You don't have to use the traditional brushes. I just thought it'd be quite nice to practice yeah, painting. Yeah, like no, that. it's a good idea. Oh, I like that. Right, I think I'll have a little bit of blue under his tummy here. Just finish off with the tongue. Nice and red. It's lovely. Once you have finished and you've let it dry, what you need to do is glue down all along that bottom edge mm -hmm. and a little way up, but don't seal all the way up at the mouth area because you need that to open up. But also, you know when you open a bottle and there's a little bit left around the bottleneck? Yeah. This is ideal. That's the bit I mean that we need. And what oh, I've done is I've threaded one up for you. Right. Just a little bit of cotton on either side. All you need to do is pop it in the mouth area because it makes the perfect fish mouth. There we go. OK. And that's now ready to flutter in the wind. Oh, lovely. Oh, they're great, Cursed. Looks like Morse being blown away by the idea of flying art, too.
Now, I wonder if Morf realised it was a strong wind that made the Great Fire of London so unstoppable in 1666. Well, I thought it'd be great to capture the Great Fire as a picture. Now, what I've done here is cut out a cityscape of medieval London. Now, there's no obvious landmarks like there is today, so all you need to do is a couple of church spires, as they were the tallest thing in the city, and maybe the odd sort of castle and house. Now, I'm going to start covering this stencil in a bit of white. And do just give it a, a dusting all over. Now I'm using nice hot colours: white, yellow, red, orange. Now, if I just get a cotton bud, now, oh, hang on, let me just work in these areas here. That's it. Fill all these gaps in. Now, if I just literally use this cotton bud to push in the white as close to the buildings as I can, this is the hottest part of the fire. 13,000 houses destroyed, yet fewer than 10 people actually lost their lives. Let's get a bit of yellow in there. Okay, let's go back to the fire now. A bit of orange there. Now I'm just going to pick a bit of orange up in the water. Here's old London Bridge. And I'm going to finish off with a bit of red. Go. Let's smudge it. Actually, smudging a bit down here. Now, just get my fingers and just twist these chalk colours together. Blend them in. Oh, it's looking nice and hot. <laughs> now, if I just take away the stencil. Look at that. Wow. <laughs> and just down here too. There you have the fire of London captured forever in chalks. Lovely. Hey, Mark, that fire effect is excellent. Hey, this picture reminds me of the time you went to Cornwall to do that fire art with Robert Bradford. That was cool. Yeah, it was cool. It was a bit wet, though. I'm here with Oliver, who's staying at Penquite Boarding Kennels on Bodmin Moor. And I'm here to find if dogs have any appreciation for art. Come on, Ollie. <laughs> Wow, this is amazing. Well, let's see what little Ollie makes of it. Barking. No, not you. That's what it's called. Barking. It was created by Cornish sculptor Robert Bradford and is famous for making huge pieces like this. Now, he's invited me down here to tackle his latest project. In fact, I'd better get a move on. Come on, mate. <laughs> Hi, folks. Hi. You all right? Wow, is this what we're making? Yeah. It is. Who came up with the designs? We split into three groups, and then we each decided to draw a face on paper like a dragon. And then we would swap them around like consequences and do somebody else's body and so on and so on until we finished the whole dragon. So who did what bits? My group drew that stomach, and it makes it look as if it's eaten too many people. And I drew that scar over there, so it looks like he's been in lots of battles. That wing was actually going to be a leg. It was only that I drew it too thin. So that we had to improvise and change it into a wing, but we now we really like it. Well, they all look great. Robert, how did you decide which ones you wanted? Partly we chose the bits we liked the best, but um, a lot of it depended on which would work best in wood. And this is our final design. Oh. That's lovely. How do we get started? You and I are going to make a very large wooden frame. Everybody here is going to do the cladding. Well, we better get started. <laughs> yeah, that's got it. So, um, Robert, do you always use natural materials? I use natural materials a lot. The sculptures at Colliford Lake Park have been made of tree waste, partly because it, they blend in with the landscape quite well. I've also used plastic toys, uh, tin cans, recycled materials, things that have a history. Right, well, is there much more to do? Yes, there is. Right, I'd better carry on hammering then. <sighs> Here we go, the final piece. 
Okay. Actually, no, Robert, this uh, wing looks just like Abby and Dawn's drawing. I did try to copy it faithfully. I just added a little double layer to give it a bit more dimension. Oh, this bit here, lovely. Yeah. Well, Robert, although you've lost two legs, I mean, not, not you personally. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm still fine. <laughs> the dragon, Robert. <laughs> the dragon's lost a leg. I think, you, I think you've done a great job on uh, getting the resemblance spot on. OK, it's close, but we need some skin. Oh, how do we make skin? Conifer, cut from fir trees in the area. Right, does that require a lot of people? It needs the troops. I'll call the troops. Put one inside the other. Hey, you know, Jack, this is looking really good. How long is it going to last? I'm just going to burn it. Burn it? When? Tonight. Tonight? Hey, Robert, Jack just told me you're going to burn it. Surely not. Oh, yes, this one's designed to go up in smoke. Well, it's finally finished. The pyrotechnicians are just putting all the special effects into place. Now all we have to do is to wait for it to go dark. Right, the tension's mounting and we're almost ready to go. So, chap, shall we have a countdown after five? You ready? Yeah. Five, four, three, two, one, go! Oh, it's amazing. Well, Robert, that's amazing, and as it's going up in flames, it's sort of taking on a whole new life. And he's rather lovely, I do love him. <laughs> I got very fond of him over the time. <laughs> hey, Mark, that was pretty hot. I like that. And it's time to look at your works of art in our gallery now and check out how hot Victoria's picture is. It's very futuristic. I like that. Yes, Rebecca's done a very spooky scene here. Now, I love the way the eyes behind the castle look as though they're watching you. Ooh. I like the fact that Rio has stuck all of these stars on. It certainly saves time on drawing them, doesn't it? How much detail has gone into Bashira's dragon here? That must have taken ages. It looks great. Now, Jessica's space scene, I reckon, is out of this world. Look at Katie's fairy just having a little rest on a toadstool there. Ah, now, Ellie has used a technique called batik to create this lovely long-haired mermaid. Now, look at the detail in Nicola's watercolour. It must have taken her ages. Every picture that's shown in our gallery gets themselves the smart sketchbook and the smart pencil set. Yes, sadly, though, we can't return any of your artwork, but keep it coming in because we love looking at it. The address will be shown at the end of the show, so get your pen and paper ready. Just thinking of the detail in that picture, actually, it's amazing the lens that some artists will go to to get their work just right. Take Turner, for example. He did some crazy things. Joseph Turner was born in London in 1775, and he started drawing very young. By the age of 13, he was exhibiting paintings in the window of his dad's barber shop. At only 15, the Royal Academy of Art showed one of his paintings. And if you look at this early picture, it's not surprising. Turner tried to paint what he felt about a scene, instead of just painting how it looked. He did really extreme things so he could capture the elements on paper. It seemed to work, though. You can almost feel the rain, steam and speed in this picture. Before he did this painting of a boat in a snowstorm, he was apparently tied to a ship's mast for four hours during a gale. Unlike most artists, Turner didn't like to sell his work, and if any of his pictures got sold, he'd feel really depressed. When he died in 1851, Turner left 350 oil paintings and 20,000 other pictures to the nation. Lucky us! So that's Joseph Turner.
Now, I'm not going to strap myself to a ship's mast, but I know where Turner was coming from. Drawing weather can be very difficult. For instance, in this picture, you don't know whether it's raining or snowing. So, the only way you can really draw the weather is to show how the weather is affecting the person or the object in your picture. For instance, we know straight away now that it's snowing because this little guy has got his teeth chattering, he's wrapping his arms tightly around him, and look, even his knees are knocking. <laughs> Poor chap. Let's go to this picture over here. Now, let's make it rain on this little bloke. So, he's looking pretty miserable. Look, his hair is soaked with water and his arms are out by his sides. If to say, look, he's just given up. He's soaking wet. And there's a little puddle underneath him, look, as well. Ah, oh, poor thing. <laughs> now, with wind, you see, you can't see that at all. So, drawing the effects of it, like I've done in this picture, worked really well. Look, even the tree is bending backwards. Now, what I've got for you here is a circle, which I want you to turn into a head. Now, I'm going to draw some weather around it. It could be rain, it could be snow, it's up to you. Now, you can download this from bbc.co.uk slash cbbc, click on art, and you'll find all the smart stuff there. Happy to me. Mark, look, I've had a go at this. It's great fun. I've done hailstorming. Look at the helmet. Oh, yeah, look, it's even got a little helmet on. <laughs> can we do oh, more of these? Uh, no, it's time to muddy things up a bit. Oh, no, what do you mean? Well, you know, get a little bit muddy. It's bigger art. Oh, excellent. I love this. You need a glass bowl with a bit of water in it. Right. OK. Well, you need a squirt of washing up liquid in that. Right. Yeah, anything else? Uh, you need a whole bottle of food colouring. Oh, and you need a straw, obviously. Right, whole bottle. OK. Now what? Just blow. Oh. Do. Well, when you've done your prints, you've got to wait for them to dry. Prints? What prints? Oh, I see. You made those prints using the bubbles? Mm-hmm. Oh, right. 
And if you keep printing on that one, your pattern really builds up nicely. Oh. Right, now for the next bit. What, there's more? Yep, I'm going to make a picture out of my bubble print. You can help me if you like. OK, then. There you go. Great. It's worked really well. Hey, actually, this is going to be an idea. Can I borrow it for a while? <laughs> Mark? Yeah? Ah, there you are. <laughs> oh, look what you're doing. You bubble mad, you, you big bubble brain. <laughs> me some more watery inspiration. I'm going to do my own underwater scene using tissue paper and water. And the first thing you need to do is cut out all of the shapes that you're going to use. You could draw out your design or, if they're easy shapes, like this rock is, just cut them straight out. And the cheaper tissue paper works better because then the dye really runs out of it. The next thing to do is just put a wash on a piece of paper. I'm using watercolour paper because then it doesn't bubble up as much as the thinner paper does and the trick here is don't put too much paint on because you don't want it soaking but you do want it to be a little bit wet and what I've done is I've just used watered down paint to get that effect so there we go and then all you need to do is start adding everything so I'm going to put on my rocks first of all it doesn't matter if it crinkles up because that gives a better effect because what happens is the dye does seep out and make this underneath. Doesn't that look great? Then you can just bin those bits and bobs. If you need to make them wetter, just add some more water so that everything goes on. So let's get the coral on. Again, just scrunch that up. See what happens when I pull that off. Yes! Working so well. What about my fish? Let's have an orange fish up there and a pink fish there and a little seahorse popped on. And if you think it's dried out too much, you can actually just dab on over the top like that, press down, which is lovely. Let's peel them off and see what we've got. A lovely fish. And you'll notice I've used really bright colours. The brighter the colour, then the stronger it comes out on that blue, which works so well. I think this just needs a frame. And we are there. Look at that. And, of course, it doesn't just have to be underwater scenes. Check out my really hot desert scene and the fireworks on bonfire night. <laughs> oh, Spade, what are you up to, man? Ooh, sorry, Kirst, a bit of an overshoot there. What are you doing, <laughs> chucking powder paint around? Oh, it's all for the sake of art. Now, listen, I'll tell you what, grab some white and just oh. chuck it over there. Just throw it? Just throw it, yeah. Brilliant. All be revealed. Trust me. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh, it feels lovely. It's good, isn't it? Whee! That's the one. Uh. Yes! Right, now I've got to try and mirror that. How you doing? <laughs> oh, ho, 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 I like that! <laughs> She's off, she's off. Wait. Wait. Go on. <laughs> <Yes>. Lovely. <laughs> Mark, are we actually achieving anything here?
<laughs> oh, here we go, here we go, here we go. Perfect. made the show end with a bang. How did you do it? Oh, elementary, my dear Kirsten. Elementary. Get it? You know, like the elements. You could say <laughs> clod. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Don't forget, you can send your pictures to us here at Smart, PO Box 5053, London W12 6AW. Fact sheets for today's show can be found on the website, bbc.co.uk slash cbbc. For the best in art, stick with Smart.